And God's people said, Amen. are you alive, church? Everybody well? I could just give the benediction and we could go home. I could, I'm not going to, don't get excited. But my goodness gracious, what a gift. Are we thankful for our music ministry in the church? I hope you are. So beautiful. Thank you, all of you. Ooh, it's good seeing you. How are you? I pray you're doing well. It is good to be in the house of the Lord. And God's people said, amen. And I will also add, it is good every time I put on a suit and it still fits. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. <laughs> God is good, God is good. I shared this, uh, I shared this with Harvest recently in uh, April of this year, I was, I was uh, attending a, a church conference in Nashville, Tennessee, and I was with my friend Brent Parker, the campus pastor at Wood Forest. And uh, where, uh, where the conference was, we stayed in a hotel right next to it, so we, we didn't rent a car when we were in Nashville. We, um, we Ubered, I don't know if you're familiar with Uber or not, I call it, it's just a fancy way to hitchhike, that's all it is. It's an app and you press a button and, and a person, they come and they pick you up. So we were Ubering from the airport, or no, we were Ubering from the hotel to the airport in Nashville, it was the last day of the conference. So I told Parker, I said, I'll fire off the Uber, I did. And I got a notification that, that less than three blocks away, the person's name was Jeanette. Jeanette was gonna be picking us up. She was driving a Honda Accord. So sure enough, we sit there. Technology is amazing. We're just right there with our bags. And here she comes. There's Jeanette. Now there's a, a picture so you can, you can see, right? So I, I kinda, I've, seen, I've seen enough of Criminal Minds that still get anxious. So I you know, look and staring at the person and matching the picture. And Parker, Brent Parker, doesn't miss a beat. He's right in the back seat. That's the safest place, apparently, when you get in a car with a stranger. So that's fine. So I'm in the front seat. It's me and my friend Jeanette. And Parker's in the back. And she, my first impression of, of, of Jeanette was, was her sunglasses. God forgive me. They were five times bigger than her face. They were, they, they were like Elton, you know the old school Elton John, those giant, I, I thought she was kidding. I think she really liked the sunglasses. I didn't say anything about it. But as we're, as we're driving to the airport, we're just cruising down the interstate going about 75 or 80 miles an hour. And I thought I'd make some small talk. So I said, Jeanette, what's your story? What's your story? I'll never forget what she said to me. She, she leaned over through those glasses and she said, would you believe that recently I was diagnosed as being legally blind? <laughs> I'm sorry? <laughs> this is a true story. Two things happened. Number one, Brent Parker just boom, grabbed my shoulder right here. <laughs> And in one grip, he communicated, we're about to see King Jesus face to face. That's what he said with that grip on my shoulder. I immediately pulled out my phone, texted my wife and kids and said, I love you very much. I'll explain later. And I, I looked at Jeanette and I said, hey, sister, here's what I'm going to need from you. I'm going to need a very quick explanation as to how you had a supernatural healing in your life because right now you got about a two-star rating from me on the Uber app. I need you to bump it up to a five-star rating. And she, she looked at me and she smiled and she said, well, I guess I didn't explain that very well. She told me the story. She said, you know, four years ago, I had a degenerative eye condition and I was losing my sight and I actually got to a place where I was, I was diagnosed as being legally blind. And she said, I, I, I can't explain it, but the little church that I went to, my mom and, 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 and friends in the church community, they, they gathered around me and they prayed for me. And she said, I had a supernatural healing in my life. She looked at me and she said, I gotta tell you, the doctors couldn't explain it, I couldn't explain it, but I knew this, I was lost and I was found, I was blind, and now I could see. And she said, let me tell you why I do this then. I'm a singer, I kind of guessed that, right? Everyone in Nashville is a singer. She said, I'm a singer, but this is why I do this. Because she said, in the four years that I've been driving for this company, I've made, I've counted, 2,000 different trips. I've had 2,000 different conversations. I've been to 2,000 different destinations, and every single one of them I've seen as a divine appointment, a divine opportunity to be able to look people in the eye wherever they are and say, guess what? There is always hope. Because she said, listen, all around me, I see there are people that are living in darkness. 
Maybe it's not a a physical darkness, but it's a spiritual darkness. She said, there are people all around me that just, I see it every day. They don't have hope. So I do this to pay it forward. She said, I picked up the woman who had been beaten by her husband for the last time, and I was able to drive her away and take her to a shelter and tell her that Jesus loves you and he has more planned for you in your life. I was able to take the man who had just gotten a terminal diagnosis and couldn't drive home to his family. He was too shaken up. And I was able to just intervene and to pray for him, to pray healing, to pray health, and to remind him that nothing separates him from the love of God. I picked up the young person who got in my car and said, you know, where am I taking you? And the young person said, I have no idea because I've got no one left in the world who loves me. And she said, I was able to look at him and say, well, there is someone who loves you and his name is Jesus. Amazing. The church of Jeanette in a four-door Honda Accord. And see, I didn't even tell her I was a pastor. I hadn't even gotten to the part to say, hey, guess what I do? <laughs> I hadn't even gotten there. And we're just sitting there, and, 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 and I'm just, I tell you, I'm, I'm in awe. And I looked at her, and I said, Jeanette, you know, I, I, share, I share with a few people every Sunday. That's kind of what I do. And I said, I, I'd love to just extend the invitation. If you want to just drive on past the airport there in Nashville and come on over to the Woodlands, Texas, I'd let you share. And she looked at me, and I'll never forget this. She said, you couldn't afford my fare. And she just <laughs> whipped right into the airport. And I said, all right, well, I'll just share it personally. I tell you what I, what I love about that story, and I tell you, why I'm never going to forget that story, and I tell you why I love to share that story. Jeanette's a hidden figure, isn't she? We're all, like, if, if we have the good news of the gospel in our lives, whether we've had a physical healing or not, let me tell you something. Jesus died for you, he died for me, and we carry the hope of the gospel, the good news of the gospel. And I believe that we should be reminded that every conversation, every moment we're interacting with someone, whether it's someone we know or someone we don't, we have an opportunity to shine a little light into their lives, amen? So if you have your Bibles, I think that's a beautiful setup to where we're gonna be today, to the hidden figure that I wanna share today. So open up your Bible, if you will, to 2 Samuel. I'm gonna be in 2 Samuel, 2 Samuel chapter nine, four and a half years of seminary. I learned something valuable in there. It's at the beginning of your Bible. It's called the table of contents. You can save a lot of time. It's alphabetized if you don't know how to get there. And this is like any great story. What I love about 2 Samuel chapter 9 is it has a great opening line. Let me share it with you. Just verse 1. It says, David asked, is there anyone still left of the house of Saul to whom I can show kindness for Jonathan's sake? Now, let me give a little bit of context for you, church. This is King David. You know, King David wasn't always a king, right? He started off as a, as a shepherd. There was a prophet that just prayed over him as he was a child and, and anointed him with oil and, and whispered into his ear, God has great things in store for you. And David went right back to the sheep and he continued to grow in wisdom and favor with the Lord. There was a moment where he was confronted by a giant, but he took the giant down and he continued to grow in favor and wisdom in relationship to the Lord. And here we see in 2 Samuel 9, David is stepping into the kingdom. He's replacing Saul. Saul had died in battle. And look at what David does in the beginning. David asks a question. Is there anyone left of the house of Saul to whom I can show some kindness for Jonathan's sake? Now, this is a pretty big deal, and I'll tell you why. Because the first question that a king really would ask is this. Is there anyone left of the previous house of the king so that I can wipe them off the face of the earth? You see, that's what a king would do. If there was anyone in the previous kingship that had any kind of ancestry, if there was anyone alive or breathing as a new incoming king, you would want to wipe them out so that they could never overpower and overthrow the new kingdom. See, Game of Thrones, it's not original. This has been going on for a very long time. So David says, hey, not is there anyone from the house of Saul that I can wipe out, But this is what makes him a man after God's own heart. He says, is there anyone from the house of Saul that I can bless? And he says that I can show kindness for who? For Jonathan's sake. And there's something else that's going on here because you see, Jonathan was King Saul's son. And Jonathan and David were best friends. And there was actually a moment when they were younger 
where Jonathan looked at David, he said, hey, listen, if anything should ever happen to me, will you make a covenant? Will you promise that you'll take care of my family? And David said, of course I will. So David, extending kindness, he's holding to the covenant that he made to the house of Jonathan, and he's blessing the house of Saul. That's how it begins. Now, verse number two, it goes a little bit further. Now, there was a servant of Saul's household named Ziba, and they summoned him to appear before David, and the king said to him, are you Ziba at your service, he replied. And the king asked, is there no one still alive from the house of Saul to whom I can show God's kindness? And Ziba answered the king, well, there is still a son of Jonathan, but he's lame in both feet. Pay attention to that. Ziba says, yeah, there is someone in the house of Jonathan, but, but he's crippled and you really don't have to worry about him. And David said, verse four, where is he? And Ziba answered, He's at the house of Machir, son of Amiel, in this place called Lodabar. You'll want to write that down and remember that, Lodabar. Verse 5, so King David had him brought from Lodabar, from the house of Machir, son of Amiel. Now, David calls in a former representative, a former servant, right, of Saul. His name is Ziba. He says, is there anyone left? Ziba says, well, there's someone, but he's damaged goods. You don't want him. You don't have to feel threatened by this guy at all. He's one of Jonathan's sons and he's crippled in both feet. And he's at this place. He's hiding out at this place called Lo Debar. Now, let me unpack it because here's our hidden figure today. His name is Mephibosheth. Again, four and a half years of seminary has trained me to say the word Mephibosheth eloquently and elegantly. You're welcome. <laughs> you know, what's interesting is Mephibosheth was not his original name. You know, when you, you see in the Old Testament, you got these chunks of scripture that says this person begat this person who begat this person, and it goes on and on and on. What's interesting is when you, when you look at the genealogy, there's actually a listing that says Saul, who was king, had a son named Jonathan. Jonathan had a son, and his name was Mabel. That's Mephibosheth's real name, Mabel. And when you look at that name and you break it down, what you find is Mabel actually translates to this opponent of Baal or in opposition to Baal. Now, Baal is a, a pagan god. So what's going on here, the context is Jonathan would have a son and he would name him Mabel. And this means that he is a child of God and he is created to stand in opposition to anyone who opposes the one true God. This is the house that he grows up in, Jonathan's house. Now imagine, he's five years old. He's having a great day. Everything is going well. He's royalty. He is given a name that means child of God in opposition to anyone who would confront or try to overthrow the true God. And at five years old, Scripture says, 2 Samuel, a few chapters back, that Saul and Jonathan were killed in battle, both of them. Now, remember what I said about if any future king takes over the kingdom, then you'd wipe out the lineage, the ancestry, anyone who had royal blood, you'd kill them. So the scripture says that at five years old, little Mabel is in the home. The doors fly open. Someone gives the report that Jonathan is dead. Saul is dead. There will eventually become a new king who will come into power. And the scripture says that the servant scoops up Mabel, starts running for the door, and as they do, they drop this five-year-old child and breaks both of his legs. It was an accident. And there's no time for a splint. There's no time for a cast. There's no time to find a doctor because time is precious. They are about to jet into the witness relocation program. They are out the door and they find refuge. They finally stop running in this place called Lo Debar, which translates to a barren, desolate wasteland. Are you following me? Mabel, child of God, tragic scene, broken legs, whisked away, and somewhere between five and this moment in 2 Samuel chapter 9, we now know that his name is Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth translates to this son of shame. In such a broken state, 
with such a, a hard hand that was dealt to him. He took on the brokenness and he claimed this name son of shame and that's where he is and David says to Ziba hey I want you to go and I want you to bring him back to the kingdom you know what Mephibosheth feared every single day of his life he feared the moment that there would be a knock at the door that he would be discovered that he would be found out he feared the moment that he would be found can you imagine the moment when that knock comes and there's Ziba and he says to Mephibosheth hey um the king's ready to see you now I guarantee you it was the longest carriage ride that he ever took back to the palace now you're in the kingdom can you imagine? Just imagine you're a guard. And there's King David sitting at the throne at the front. And here comes Mephibosheth in the back. Listen, look at what happens. When Mephibosheth, son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, came to David, he bowed down to pay him honor. Now, when you bow before a king, I want you to take the full story in. I want you to put yourself in the story. When you bow before a king, it's, it's not just a little curtsy. It's a little bit more than that. To truly bow before a king, you got to get down on the floor. You got to take your forehead and you have to press it all the way. You get as low as you possibly can. Can you imagine the moment, Mephibosheth, knocking on death's door and he just falls on the floor and he bows before the king and David says, Mephibosheth. And Mephibosheth said, at your service. And David said, don't be afraid. For I will surely show you kindness for the sake of your father, Jonathan. I'll restore to you all of the land that belonged to your grandfather, Saul, and you will always eat at my table. Now that, church, in case you don't know, that's called good news. <laughs> That's the moment that we wait for, right? That's when the confetti guns go off. That's when the publisher's clearinghouse van is in front and they're coming with the giant check. I mean, that's when you have the party, right? But what do you see Mephibosheth do? Look at this response. Mephibosheth says, what is your servant that you should notice a dead dog like me? Do you hear joy in that? Do you hear hope in that? See, that's what brokenness will do. Have you ever had a Mephibosheth moment in your life where you just feel like you have been dealt blow after blow after blow and the clouds settle in and, and you just feel like there'll never be hope, that you'll never see sunlight again? David is breaking through the clouds saying, brother, life is about to change for you. But Mephibosheth, he doesn't see it. And I, I, You can't read this in here. It doesn't say this in here. But I believe with all of my heart, tears well up in the eyes of David because he sees someone that's broken physically, someone that's broken emotionally, someone that's broken spiritually before him who can't even open a hand to receive the blessing that he's making available to him. So what does David do? The king summoned Ziba, Saul's steward, and he said to him, hey, I've given your master's grandson everything that belonged to Saul and his family. You and your sons and your servants, you're to farm the land for him and bring in the crops so that your master's grandson may be provided for. And Mephibosheth, grandson of your master, will always eat at my table. I think David smiles and says, hey, Ziba, remember the guy that you said was nothing to worry about? Why don't you and your family and your servants just take care of him for the rest of your life? Thank you very much. God bless you. Have a good day. And Ziba just smiles, you know, he's like, yay! <laughs> Verse 11, Ziba said to the king, your servant will do whatever my lord the king commands his servant to do. And this line right here, the story's got a great beginning. It's got a heartbreaking middle, but listen to the end. So Mephibosheth ate at David's table like one of the king's sons, and he did it for the rest of his life. 
Mephibosheth ate at the king's table like one of his sons, and he did it for the rest of his life. You know why I love this story? You know why this story just sticks to me that I'll never forget this story? I love this story because Mephibosheth's story is my story. Mephibosheth's story is your story. Have you ever had any kind of brokenness in your life? Let me tell you something. The enemy wants you to be defined by your brokenness. The enemy wants you to be defined by the pain, by the mistakes, by the past. The enemy is fearful that you're going to find the freedom that God has made available to you through Jesus Christ. Listen, Romans 3.23, what does it say? I grew up in the Baptist church. I learned it well. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Yes, all. Not a few of us. Not a certain number of people. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We're all broken. But listen, when you're quoting Romans 3.23, please learn 3.24. Don't put a period where Paul had actually put a comma. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Here it is. But we are justified freely because of what Jesus Christ has done on the cross. Amen? Amen. Church, that is good news. We are, we are all broken. Yes, we're broken, but we're not defined by our brokenness. We are defined that we are children of the most high God. And listen, if that doesn't get you excited, this will do it for you. Are you ready? Sure, we're broken, but we're not defined by our brokenness. But get this, just as David pursued Mephibosheth, King Jesus pursues us every single day. You know that? I love that Paul says, he says this over and over. Read the epistles, read the letters, and you see he refers to himself as a prisoner to the Lord Jesus Christ then. He says that a lot. And here's what he means when he's saying that. He says, as a prisoner to the Lord Jesus Christ then. See, the enemy wanted Paul to be defined as Saul by his past. He was a Christian killer. But Jesus says, I'm in the business of making all things new. So when Paul says, as a prisoner to the Lord Jesus Christ, what he's saying is, I am chained to the good news of the gospel. I'm chained to the love of Jesus Christ that I can pull, I can try to get away, but God's love, God's mercy, God's redemptive power will never let me go. Praise the Lord. He looks at us in the midst of our stain, in the midst of our brokenness, and he says, beautiful, redeemed, beloved, You are my child. Yes, we're broken. But we're not defined by our brokenness. We're defined as children of the most high God. We're pursued by Jesus who will never let us go. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall never perish but have eternal life in this. For God didn't send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. So, I want to make sure we're all on the same page. Broken, but not defined by our brokenness. Pursued by Jesus who will never let us go. And here's the other part that I love about this story. Is the table covers any brokenness that we have in our lives. Think about this. Maybe it took Mephibosheth a day Maybe it took him a week, maybe it took him a month to finally settle in and realize that this fairy tale was not a fairy tale, that it was reality. And when he pulls up to the king's table and he finds himself seated under that table, any person that walked by, they didn't see a cripple. They didn't see someone with brokenness because, you see, the table covered the brokenness that he had. We, church, you, me, brother and sister, we are covered by the cross of Jesus Christ that takes away any stain, that covers any brokenness. When Jesus said, it is finished, he truly meant it. So may we, as the body of Christ carry this message, Mephibosheth's story, it's my story, it's your story, and for the rest of our days, may we hold to the grace and the good news of this story. May we find ourselves seated at the table, and may we be reminded nothing removes us from that table. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and God's people said, amen. Amen. Would you do me a favor? Yeah, we can clap for that. 
I'd love for you, if you will, would you stand? And I want to pray for you. And we're going to sing a hymn of invitation. But just open your hands. Put your palms up for me. Just close your eyes. Don't, don't get scared. It's not a charismatic thing. We're going to be okay. I'd love to just open my hands sometimes because when we receive a word, sometimes we need to let our hands just stay open a little bit just to remind us that we're called to receive that, to take hold of it. So Heavenly Father, I wanna pray over my friends. I wanna pray over my family in this space today. God, I am thankful for the good news. And this is good news. God, you don't look at us and condemn us and judge us and beat us down with how miserable we are. But Father, you see us and you pick us up just like Peter in the water and you say, it's okay, I've got you. So whatever darkness is covering up my friends in this space today, I just pray that the power of the Holy Spirit would just break that darkness in two. That, Father, the doors that are closed to the rooms that the people dwell in, that, Father, your hope and your love and your compassion would blow open those doors and that peace that Paul says that passes all understanding, Father, that it would just blow over the lives of those that are here today. Father, thank you. You never give up on us. So, Lord, may we be a reflection of the love that you have, and let's take this message now and live it out into the world, for we love you, we praise you, we thank you, and it's in your name that we say, amen.